Strip mining the moon, disturbing its billion year slumber, does seem somewhat arrogant, but it's necessary to bring forth continued prosperity, to grow life beyond the confines of Earth, and ascend into the rest of the solar system. If we want this kind of future, one in which we avoid stagnating and descending into a post-growth dark age, then we need to exploit the endless energy and overwhelming resources of space. And to do that, we'll need to build spacecraft, stations, and infrastructure. And it makes sense to build these out of the moon. This is the case for lunar industrialization, for growing our economy beyond mere tourism and science, for becoming a solar system spanning civilization. The moon is a giant ball of feedstock material orbiting Earth, just waiting to be turned into useful things. But to turn the moon into useful things, we'll need to use heavy machines. The idea that one can just scoop up pieces of the moon and turn it directly into steel and stuff does seem too good to be true. If that's the case, then why can't we do that here on Earth? The truth is, Earth's surface material used to be more like the moon's until about 4.2 billion years ago when life emerged and just began endlessly splitting and shitting and shedding all over the place. Now Earth dirt is covered in nasty organic molecules and this moist mix of metals and minerals and organic matter is what we call soil. No other celestial body has true soil like on Earth. What we call soil on other planets like Mars is still technically fine regolith. Earth soil, that stuff all around us, in us, is as unique in the universe as life itself. Playing in Earth soil is playing with the dead parts of everything that ever lived before us and everything that will ever live after us. Lunar regolith is more like lava rock. It's hard to imagine scooping up field dirt and fashioning it into an iron dagger, sure, but what about forging an iron dagger from lava rock? This is how early Bronze Age civilizations like the Hittites first made iron in small quantities, by smelting iron-rich rocks in charcoal bloomeries. And Japanese katanas are famously forged from tamahogany, which is made from volcanic iron sand. So we actually do have lunar regolith analogs here on Earth, that have historically been used to make metal things. But we don't see iron basalt mines today because we have 8 billion brains and 16 billion hands and advanced manufacturing grandfathered in. So we can afford to make our mining operations a bit more complex than scooping up volcanic sand just as we can afford to manufacture Ferraris. The major constraint in modern mining operations is energy as it requires more energy to process lower grade ores, which leads to higher prices, which makes you less competitive on the earth market. So on earth, we can afford to front load complexity for more efficiency and thus lower prices. But on the moon, we have the opposite problem. We have tons of energy and no market competition, but we cannot afford much complexity. So we trade energy for complexity and mine regolith directly. This isn't to say we shouldn't seek out and mine rich veins of ore on the moon. We should. There should be naturally formed lunar loads from the moon's original formation, L-O-D-E, which is different from load L-O-A-D and is a term used in mining to describe a rich vein of metal ore. And we should take on as many fat lunar loads as we can handle. But consider that one of the major reasons lunar regolith is so rich is that every asteroid impact, every crater on the moon, deposited more material into the lunar surface from deep space. In many ways, mining lunar regolith is the easiest and most efficient method of asteroid mining. If Earth's regolith is unique in that it is mixed with the dead remains of billions of years of body parts, then the lunar regolith is unique in that it is mixed with the dead remains of billions of years of asteroid parts. Also, I should mention that the diminishing quality of Earth's ore deposits is a significant issue in modern mining and metallurgy. Over time, as high quality, easily accessible ores have been depleted, the industry has increasingly turned to lower grade deposits. 
This trend isn't unique to iron, it's a major issue pretty much across the board in nearly all mining efforts from coal to copper and nickel. The so-called golden age of ore quality likely peaked during the mid-1800s. During this period, many of the world's richest and most accessible ore deposits were discovered and developed such as the Mesabi Range in Minnesota, and the rich copper mines in Chile were some of the most significant contributors to the global metal supply. These high-grade deposits allowed for relatively easy extraction and refining, leading to a period of rapid industrial growth with comparatively lower energy costs and environmental impacts than we see today. Historically, high-grade iron ore with iron content above 60% was abundant. These ores, like those found in Brazil and Australia, were easily mined and processed with minimal energy. However, much of this high-grade ore has been depleted, forcing miners to exploit lower-grade ores with iron content as low as 25%. Lunar Regolith has half this at about 12% iron content. The fact that every decade we slide further down this diminishing quality trend line is even more reason we need to develop the moon and begin exploiting space resources. If we don't, then we may very well find ourselves engaging in the ancient Bronze Age tradition of expending massive amounts of energy, mining and refining 12% iron soils here on Earth, which really gives off planetary exhaustion, scarcity-induced, end-of-times resource war vibes. On the other hand, expending massive amounts of energy mining and refining 12% iron soils on the moon really gives off prosperous, expansion space-induced golden age resource abundance vibes. And massive machines moving megatons of lunar regolith vibe hard. The first heavy machinery we use to break ground on the moon will no doubt be imported from Earth. Earth made machines to make machines on the moon. But machines made on the moon out of the moon will need to be made differently, designed differently than their earth-born progenitors. They will need to be designed simply so they can be manufactured easily and repaired effortlessly. They need to be made from parts that work in the lunar environment and, for the most part, are made from local lunar resources. This means no rubber or plastics, pulleys and cables in place of hydraulics, wheels instead of tracks, sodium and sterling instead of diesel and gasoline. This is what we discussed in a previous video. Simple steel standardized sodium powered shovels, dozers, and hoppers. Like steam shovels of old, the sodium shovel excavator would be used to dig in depth. Holes and pits to host humans and plants. We also designed a steel, wheeled, sodium powered blade pusher. This lunar dozer would be used to move regolith and scrape areas and demolish town halls. Its only weakness would be basements. And finally, we threw in a open-topped hopper uh, on wheels that would be used to... Okay, we'll talk about bucket wheel excavators. These big boys are used for continuous work, moving massive amounts of material at a time, which is why they're typically used to remove overburden the material lying between you and the valuable deposit of coal or gold or feet picks you're trying to get to. So just as the sodium shovel makes sense for digging holes, and dozers make sense for clearing and scraping and leveling and moving piles of regolith, a bucket wheeled excavator makes the most sense for gathering massive amounts of regolith at a time, right? Well, as usual, I have to be a bit of a contrarian turd and push back on established ideas. Instead of a bucket wheel excavator, we might consider the merits of a bucket chain excavator which has some important advantages in the lunar environment. While the bucket wheel is very good for carving up the German countryside to feed their post-nuclear coal addiction, its main drawback is it is mostly intended to be placed in a pit mine where it can dig horizontally. It's primarily designed to work sideways, carving out walls, not floors. For the majority of the lunar surface, particularly in the Maria regions, we need to dig down, not to the side. A bucket wheel can do this, it can dig down, but a bucket chain can do it better because that's what it was primarily designed for, and as such, it is much more efficient at excavating a wider area. Consider that from all we know, the regolith is only between 5 to 10 meters deep, 
so we really need the capability to dig across a wide and long surface patch rather than in a deep pit mine. In the wheel design, only about a quarter of the buckets are performing work at a given time, while in the chain design, it's more like three-fifths of the buckets. But wheel designs more than make up for this lack of surface contact by simply rotating faster. But since gravity is much lower on the moon than on Earth, the wheel will impart centrifugal forces on the load within the bucket, and unless it moves very slowly, the regolith will be slung out of the bucket. On the other hand, the bucket chain is slower, so it has less forces trying to toss the load, and it has a lot more buckets performing work at any given time. Quantity has a quality of its own. And for you anticipated commenters who are going to scream sharp lunar regolith will cause abrasion and ruin everything, crash the stock market, send plagues of locusts to blot out the sun and wither our crops and turn the Nile red, well, all I have to say is size does matter. Bigger is better as scale really negates much of the abrasion. Just ask your mom. You don't think those massive machines working in pit mines don't get scratches? Sure, we have the convenience of oil and grease here on Earth, but there are alternatives on the moon. And if not, then we can just embrace the abrasion as a normal part of wear and tear. And in doing so, we can design the specific parts that experience the most wear to be replaced easily. Okay, alright, as an apologetic offering for destroying everybody's favorite notion of bucket wheel excavators on the moon, in favor of bucket chain excavators, I know you may never forgive this transgression, but I at least want to offer some means of consolation in the form of feet picks. In the previous video on heavy machinery, we discussed how tracks aren't ideal on the moon because of regolith and the difficulty of maintenance. That gives us one problem though. Large heavy machines need to distribute ground pressure over a large area to avoid sinking into the ground when working. They also need large contact surfaces to provide better grip so they don't simply displace regolith rather than themselves. This means any large machine will need a lot of wheels. A lot of wheels means a lot of bearings and regolith ingress into these bearings will naturally mean a lot of maintenance. It might sound like sci-fi, but for the better part of a century, many excavators have been walking around on feet instead of wheels or tracks. Feet give most of the benefits of tracks, but sacrifice speed, and the mechanism itself is just an eccentric shaft. If we add four of these, we have a stable, low part count drivetrain that is easy to manufacture and maintain. This mode of locomotion is slow but we aren't very concerned with speed on this building sized machine. And so putting it all together, we might get something that looks like this. It can be completely teleoperated and you can have a fleet of them strip mining the moon. It's able to rotate and excavate at a 90 degree angle from the direction it walks. So it will carve out an area of regolith as wide as its boom, as fast as it can walk, as far as it can travel. The regolith can be transported from the excavator slowly walking across the moon back to the processing area via a land train. While I do favor tracks in general, a land train makes the most sense in this case because it will be constantly moving. Considering the largest bucket chain excavators in operation here on Earth are capable of excavating up to 14,500 cubic meters an hour, we really are looking at strip mining the moon. When working on scales this large, it'll be useful to divide areas of land into units. I propose a 1 km by 1 km by 1 meter unit. Why 1 meter in depth instead of a cubic kilometer? Well, because the lunar regolith is only 5 to 10 meters deep, so instead of saying an area is a square kilometer 4 meters deep, we can simply say 4 of these units. This is similar to an acre foot, which is a unit used in the US to measure bodies of water and wetland areas. Technically, 1 kilometer by 1 kilometer by 1 meter would be equal to a megasteer, or a gigaliter, but these are quantities, not dimensions. 325,851 gallons isn't an acre foot. The acre foot does contain 325,851 gallons, but that isn't what defines it. Rather, it is defined by the fact it is exactly one foot deep across an area the size of a square acre. It's dimensions. 
Same idea here. But instead of telling us things like how much water pressure we're dealing with when constructing a dam or how many ducks can live in an area, this new unit is useful as a shorthand reference for resource yields. If you know you need to produce an extra 10 gigawatt hours worth of battery storage during this two week long lunar day, sodium ion batteries are 7% sodium by mass and have power densities of about 100 watt hours a kilogram, and you know one of these units yields 8,000 tons of sodium, then you know you'll need to harvest 1.2 of these units to gather enough sodium for your storage needs. But you could do the same math with simple cubic meters. Creating a new unit like this is totally unnecessary technically but it's fun so it's totally necessary philosophically and why not so what then should we call this new unit defined by dimensions equal to that of a square kilometer one meter deep i had a name picked out but then i thought why not let you find folks decide so discord and patreon members submitted their name proposals and we held a vote on youtube and you monkeys voted to call this new unit the lunar load we can credit patron member stephen reed for coming up with this name thank you stephen we are happy to receive your lunar load perhaps this term conceived in 2024 will gestate in the minds of the masses and will still be in use across the solar system hundreds of years from now lunar regolith has a density of 1.6 grams a cubic centimeter this means, on average, a lunar load of regolith weighs 1.6 billion kilograms, or 1.6 million tons. With this information, we can calculate the resource yields per load, which I've done, and you can see the results on the screen now. I've also tried to give a sense of scale by also converting the yields to 20-foot equivalent units, and from there, the number of Panamax-sized cargo ships worth of stuff. For example, we can yield 13.5 Panamax class ships worth of oxygen per lunar load, which hopefully gives you a better sense of just how much oxygen we're going to have, an abundance, an excess. And considering about four-fifths of a rocket's mass is from the oxidizer, you can see now why the moon would provide not only the materials to build a solar system spanning civilization, but also four-fifths of the fuel to propel its expansion. So I guess to close out this video, I just want to calculate how much steel we could make per lunar load to give a sense of its utility and what orders of magnitude we're actually talking about. But not all steel is made equal. There are many different types of steel and variations, all with different applications. So what kind of steel should we make on the moon? Well, that depends on the constraints we have. We primarily lack carbon, but carbon often makes up less than 1% of a kilogram of steel. While something like chromium, which we have more of, but still not much, makes up around 18% in S300 series stainless steel, while carbon only makes up 0.1%. So although we have less carbon on the moon than chromium, we are not constrained by carbon in making S300 steel. We are constrained by chromium because of the relative proportions. So ideally, we want to find a type of steel that has high amounts of the metals we have high amounts of and low amounts of those we have low amounts of. Basically, we want one that matches our resource profile, but that also has good material properties like tensile strength. Also, I should note, there is no perfect type of steel for the moon. There are only variations, just like here on Earth. We don't use just one type of steel, we have dozens of varieties, but we do have some types of steel that are used way more often because they meet the needs for most general applications and are cheap and easy to make, namely low carbon steels. Similarly on the moon, we'll have different contexts requiring different types of steel. For example, because of the thermally fluctuating environment, we will be very concerned with thermal expansion for things that will be exposed on the surface, like vehicles. So we'll want to find a steel type that has a low thermal expansion coefficient, while for buildings and habitats that are going to be buried under a few meters of highly insulating lunar regolith, we are more concerned with tensile strength since they'll be pressurized. So we have a different environment with a different set of constraints and considerations and a different resource profile to work from to meet each of those demands. 
And to figure this out, you'd really need NASA or someone to perform an in-depth analysis on the optimal metallurgical composition of lunar forged steels, weighing many different variables. But look, we're basically playing at being an off-brand, low-budget NASA. We're NASA at home, and as such, we can get away with cutting corners. We're just trying to get a sense of things, playfully poking at potentials. So let's be lazy and just see if there are any steel variations commonly used here on Earth whose profile sort of approximates that of our resource yield. I won't bore you by combing through material property data sheets. The type that has the closest lunar load profile I could find is classic 1080 steel. Here is its composition. It is mostly iron with less than 2% of its weight made up by alloys and the alloys it is made of are ordered closely to that of our chart except for carbon, which is going to be the single biggest constraint in any lunar activity, not just steel making. Carbon is what makes steel steel. Carbonless steel is not steel, it's wrought iron, and wrought iron can be used. It was used to build the Eiffel Tower, so it's likely to be used for the first structures we make on the moon early on. But in general, you do want to strike a balance between ductility and hardness, which is why steel is so useful. So we should upgrade to steel as quickly as possible. And to be clear, we don't have to use steel. We don't even have to import carbon. You could make your lunar shelters out of raw iron or your submarines from wood and your fallout bunkers from bricks. But it's probably worth going the somewhat small extra effort to make steel, especially as launch costs to the moon fall. Okay, so how much type 1080 steel could we yield per lunar load? Well, the limit is carbon, and carbon makes up 0.18% of type 1080 steel by weight, so we can yield 88,888 tons of this kind of steel from the 160 tons of carbon we mined. With carbon imports though, the limit becomes manganese, which is actually the most used alloy in type 1080, making up 0.9%. So we need about 5 times more manganese than carbon, but we yield 20 times more of it per load. So it is the most used alloy, but the second constraint proportionally. Given that we yield 3,200 tons of manganese per load, we could make 355,555 tons of 1080 steel from this amount. But to do so, we need 640 tons of carbon, and we only gather 160 tons per load. So we need to import 480 to maximize our steel yield. This is a lot of carbon to import, but you can do a lot with steel, and 355 and a half thousand tons is a lot of steel. It is equal to 14 cruise ships, nine Burj Khalifas, or five Nimitz-class aircraft carriers, and yes, I did convert US to metric tons. But what I really want to figure out is how much steel would be required to construct a Stanford tourist station, and after that, an O'Neill cylinder. Except there's one little tricky detail we haven't really delved into, and that's the fact it would take about 2.8 terawatt hours of electricity to produce these 355,000 tons of steel, which is about as much energy as a mid-sized city consumes in a year. But again, ample electricity is one of the major benefits of space, so it's not as daunting as it may sound. Regardless, before we talk about how many tourist stations and O'Neill cylinders we can yield per lunar load, or how many lunar loads we need per O'Neill cylinder, we must first talk about power, which we'll have to wait for the next video. So stay tuned, and thank y'all so much for 10k subscribers. It's crazy to think there's basically a medieval army's worth of people watching my videos. Soon we shall march on the holy lunar lands to claim them for all mankind. And thank you to the patron and channel members who turned this no-budget NASA into a low-budget NASA. And just as a reminder, my book How to Develop the Moon is free for all on Patreon. You don't have to join, it's just a convenient way to distribute it as a PDF. Published physical copies are available on Amazon, which I make no profit from, but donations are greatly appreciated if you have some coin to spare. Alright, see y'all next time.